At present, India's manufacturing sector contributes only 17% of the country's total GDP. In contrast, in strong manufacturing sectors, this contribution uh, has consistently remained above 30%. To stay relevant and competitive, India requires a much needed leap. And therefore, it's important for manufacturing companies to understand and, and reconsider the options available to them. At this time, it appears that the most impactful solution available to enable growth is the use of technology. Now, technology has been acknowledged as the backbone of business innovation and transformation. And the wave of emerging technologies presents new means of generating both revenues and cost savings. Through the adoption of these new technologies, the Indian manufacturing sector can grow both as a cost leader and as a differentiator. 9.9 Media, in partnership with technology experts PTC, have have put together an interesting panel of practitioners and industry and technology experts to discuss how the advent of enterprise technology has positively impacted Indian manufacturing. We're privileged to have with us Sandeep Batra, CFO Crompton Greaves, Consumer Electricals, Tanushri Bagrodia, CFO and VP IT, NRB Bearings, Abhijit Majumdar, Executive Director and Technology Strategy Consulting Leader at PwC, Dhirendra Kulkarni, Technical Sales Director at PTC India. Our experts will delve deeper on the need for greater efficiency in manufacturing setups and how businesses can benefit immensely by adopting new enterprise solutions. Abhijit, what do you think will be the key drivers that will shape the future of Indian manufacturing? There are uh, three global macro trends uh, that are currently shaping the manufacturing industry. First is the emergence of new uh, manufacturing superpowers like uh, Mexico, uh, Thailand, uh, in Indonesia, etc. Second is uh, a lot of negative pressure on growth due to restrictive trade policies and reshoring options that some of the large economies like the US and the UK are adopting. And thirdly, uh, emergence of a lot of new technologies that are powering the resurgence of what we are calling the fourth revolution of, of the industrial era. So I think uh, these, are, these three factors are significantly changing the way uh, the manufacturing industry is uh, is shaping up specifically in uh, for the context of India if we take a cue from these manufacturing superpowers and how they have done well in the past I think there are three key drivers for us to consider firstly uh, we need to take advantage of our uh, natural advantages so India has a very deep demographic dividend 60 percent of the population under 30 so high quality labor at fairly uh, reasonable costs. Uh, so I think in a good uh, focus on education uh, in our social systems, so I think that's something that we need to first take care of and, and invest in. Secondly, uh, invest a lot in creating and maintaining the, tech, the, the competitive advantage. The moment you, you come up to a certain amount uh, as a manufacturing power, I think there are others who are going to catch up. So there's, a, there's an imperative to make a lot of investment in education and, and uh, R&D so that uh, India can cont continue to retain that advantage uh, once it becomes a superpower. And third, uh, and most importantly, have targeted government and policy interventions like Make in India, Skill India, Design India, that can help uh, make targeted inter interventions for specific sectors. So I think okay. these are the three key imperatives or key drivers that India needs to focus on. Tanushri, um, technology has played a key role in enhancing operations and manufacturing. Uh, can you tell us how it's impacted your industry? I think, uh, so NRB is, uh, it manufactures, uh, designs, manufactures friction solutions for the mobility industry. And I think uh, right from the product design to the delivery of the solution, technology has, um, changed the way we operate significantly. For example, the export business started in 2000 thanks to NRB starting um, an R&D center, wherein we not only used the PLM softwares given by PTC, but we also developed our own uh, 
invested in developing our own proprietary software. What is available in market is a lot of simulation software for ball bearings. Predominantly our products uh, are uh, you know, needle bearings, cylindrical roller bearings, and pins and planetary shafts. So getting simulation software for this was not easy. So we've invested heavily into uh, a proprietary software which can complement what's available in the market. So that's really helped us design products which have got us export business right from 2000 onwards. Going forward, uh, you know, it's on the shop floor if you see precision is a significant requirement in the, in the friction solutions industry. And there, the kind of machines that are now coming can actually go down to half a micron uh, precision levels. And that's all been made possible because of the electrical uh, technology. So we've invested heavily into those machines. And then coming to the delivery stage, even to the delivery stage, the adoption of technology has been uh, seen in, uh, you know, from the smallest of saying today, can we have a GPS put into our vehicles that are going from the plants to the warehouses to be able to track them. To using uh, uh, QR codes and other similar mechanism to uh, avoid counterfeit in the, in the aftermarket or the uh, you know, replacement market uh, that is there. So I think technology has changed everything from the design to the delivery phase. But there is a lot more uh, that we can do, and specifically on the shop floor, uh, you know, machine to machine technology has been there for a very long time. We can use that a lot more effectively to get real time data to make more informed decisions, and that's the attempt that we are making uh, going forward. Okay. Sandeep, similarly, how has technology impacted your industry? So, um, in our <laughs> case, actually, the uh, Technology has played a bit of a disruptive role uh, in the kind of products that my company uh, deals in. So we deal in uh, consumer electrical products, namely fans, lights, uh, pumps, and some appliances. But I think the biggest disruption that happened led by technology was in the lighting industry, where you know overnight from a traditional lighting products, light source right. products, the whole industry shifted to LED. Um, and that was in some in, uh, in some manner led by the government, where the government led a program of uh, bidding and inviting quotations for LED bulbs, which they would then mass distribute. Uh, that initiative of the government suddenly gave scale to the manufacturers, and we saw prices of uh, LED bulbs come down from 250, 260 rupees to 60 rupees in a period of 12 to 18 months. That disruption, while enabled by technology, had severe implications at the end of the manufacturer. Traditional lighting companies had massive investments, predominantly to make glass, because all bulbs or you know all that you had lighting products uh, had uh, glass casings. That overnight became redundant. So you know if your competitive advantage was in making glass, that no longer counted. All you need to do was to import the LED chips assemble them and start selling them in the market. So technology at one end for us was massively disrupted, took out a lot of uh, profitability of the companies. But if you look at it from an opportunity point of view, it gave a lot of companies the opportunity suddenly to do a big catch up because there was this big disruption that right. was happening uh, in the industry. So you no longer had to be a market leader in the traditional lighting products to be necessarily be a market leader in the new uh, LED technology. So that, in some sense, uh, played to our advantage. Dhirendra, how is uh, Internet of Things changing the face of design? Yes, of course. Uh, the Internet of Things has a, a big influence on the product design. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, for example, this new product requirements, right, usually comes from uh, historical data or maybe a feedback. But the large portion of it comes from the assumptions. So when you do the new design, uh, when you do a new product design, you validate it based on certain assumptions. Because with no uh, insight to the product information, what's happening in the real uh, in the real field on the real time, you know, a designer tends to validate his design based on the assumptions, and this leads to a, a probably an under design or, or most of the time an over design, right? Uh, so in either way, it has a cost impact. 
So IoT, with IoT has an ability to connect the product uh, and get the information back to the design. So designer can use that information to do a design and validate based on the real time information rather than the assumptions, which becomes much more closer to the real time, uh, uh, real time performance, right? So this is a, a big impact uh, IoT has on the product design. And all CAD platforms, uh, which is primary uh, design tools, uh, has to uh, provide the ability for this. And uh, this we call this for uh, design for connectivity. For example, we have uh, design for manufacturability, design for serviceability, design for assembly. So this is a new uh, feature like design for connectivity and uh, PTC as a primary uh, technology provider. Uh, we have uh, led the way with uh, Creo 4.0 where we, ha we give this feature to design for connectivity. Abhijit, with Make in India in the backdrop, how do you look at India as an emerging geography for uh, digital manufacturing? So Make in India is a, a set of policy reforms and initiatives that the government of India has introduced uh, for es essentially manufacturing performance. Uh, some of them have already taken off the ground. So for example, uh, GST, it's ready to be implemented in July. Uh, FDI, uh, norms have been re uh, relaxed in 15 uh, sectors first and, and then nine later, so around 22 sectors. Uh, in finance, uh, repo rates have been uh, reduced to 6.25%. Uh, on the infrastructure and transportation side, I think 15,000 kilometers of roads are being constructed in 2017 alone and, and more ne next year. Uh, on the power side, uh, with, uh, with the Uday and you know, increase in capacity of solar uh, uh, power capacities, I think a lot of these things have, beginning, have begun to take off the ground now. So we are beginning to see a lot of changes uh, happening in, in most of these areas. Uh, the mood and the sentiment in the industry is definitely upbeat because of these visible changes. What needs to happen is uh, a concerted effort on behalf of both the stalwarts and the captains of the industry and the policy makers to continue with this momentum and to take these initiatives forward, irrespective of the political you know, mandates coming and going. And secondly, and more importantly, is to continue to invest in adoption of emerging technologies. For example, IoT, drones, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, etc. So that uh, the, the insights that can be you know, drawn can be, can be leveraged in, in the manufacturing process. So I think overall, uh, if India has to become a manufacturing superpower, we are looking at a 9 to 10% per annum growth uh, in the sector. And that can only happen if a multi-pronged approach on both these counts, on the policy side as well as the technology adoption side, happens simultaneously. So I think it, to that effort, uh, Make in India is certainly uh, the right set of initiatives uh, in this direction. Tanushi, what do you think are the key drivers for new technology adoption within your sector? So if you look at what are the drivers for technology adoption and we take the mundane uh, world of manufacturing and the short term requirements, I think it's largely enhanced productivity and profitability that will call for technology adoption and you know one can't live without it. For example, can we do prototyping using additive manufacturing, it's mass prototyping, it'll make things a lot cheaper. On the shop floor, can we have increased automation to increase production, uh, productivity and precision? You know, that, that, that's a no-brainer. On the other side, it's the consumer aspiration which is a driver for technology adoption. I mean, today the entire world of mobility is being disrupted with something which is starting from electric to driverless vehicles, going over to something as simple as we all use in our daily lives, which is the Uber. And there again, I think we will have to start uh, uh, understanding that the coming generation has completely different aspirations. And to that, if we do not adopt technology in our own uh, manufacturing facilities, we will be irrelevant. Just to give you a small example, you know, can we focus just on passenger vehicles? Because today's, uh, the new generation doesn't want to own cars. If, if, the, if we forget that aspect, that you know, the, the new generation doesn't want to own cars, the business will suffer. So what we've got to see is we've now got to up our technology game to say, from passenger vehicles, can we start focusing more on defense? Can we start supplying more to aerospace? 
so that we as a business remain more relevant. And if you see, that's that's the way the entire ACMA world is working today. That right. all the autocom manufacturers, especially with this Make in India uh, uh, program, they're all gearing towards supplying to the um, defense and the aerospace sector. So I think the short term, medium term, and long term have different requirements from every organization to adopt different sorts of technologies. <coughs> and in <coughs> that, maintaining profitability and productivity is paramount. Decision making comes second. And the third is looking at what are the disruptive technologies that are coming. And I think uh, we just spoke about Industry 4.0 and we can't sort of neglect that entire networking pattern that's going to come in. So I think uh, those are the drivers okay. for technology adoption. Uh, Abhijit, in your opinion, uh, which industries would be the early adopters of connected products? Uh, so I'll again you know, refer to the uh, CEO survey that we did last year. And, and while industrial products and manufacturing seems to be leading the pack uh, globally as well as also in India, within that, automobiles is the sector that seems to be uh, ready for the for the you know, next big big leap into adoption of all these connected devices, and when I say automobiles, it includes uh, not only the uh, OEMs but also the you know, ancillaries. So uh, I think not only in terms of current thinking but also the investment that these uh, companies are making, and I'll refer to what right. uh, Tanushree mentioned uh, that they are doing. Uh, we are seeing a significant traction uh, compared to last year as to what they are doing now compared to just thinking. Right. So uh, the projection for about 2020 is that uh, automobile sector will lead the entire pack in terms of adoption before others like smart cities, etc., come up and catch up. So I'll just add to it, uh, it. You know, it's not just that automotive will get there. If you look at some of the uh, some of the designs that have already come out in the developed world. Today you have the dashboards made of entire uh, glass panels, wherein you know, the, the driver sitting can just touch the glass panel and actually direct what's happening in her home, right. okay? It's, it's happening. And yes, the ancillaries are so forced to actually adopt this connected technology because today uh, it's imperative for us to know that if the transmission, so our bearings go in transmission, if the transmission is having a problem, is it because of the bearing? Is it because of the lubricant? If it is because of the bearing, which part of the bearing is causing a problem? So eventually, we will need to get down to that sort of detail. But the automotive industry is far ahead in terms of connectivity. The modular transmission that I spoke of is actually reality today. You can Google for modular transmission, and you will see that companies are using it. I mean, we've already had. Um, uh, a driverless truck deliver right. 50,000 Budweiser's, uh, right? That, that's already happened. Mm. So if you have this driverless vehicle, they will need to have these modular transmissions. So it's already in play. And I completely agree. It's a, it's a very, very exciting time for the automobile industry going forward. Great. So I think uh, we spoke at length about, you know, the different technologies that are uh, coming up or have or, are in different stages of adoption. And I think... Uh, uh, it's not only significantly impacting the entire value chain, it's also beginning to throw up new challenges for the entire manufacturing sector. So if you look at the entire value chain, so there's a downstream, which is uh, the design, manufacturing, logistics, warehouse, and then the upstream of sales, marketing, after-sales support, right? So while the upstream has sort of been taken care of uh, to a great extent over the last 10 years through CRMs and, and various other information technology, the downstream work, which is the operational technology, I think there's a lot of these disruptions happening, which we spoke of. So in the design, there's uh, data-led design thinking that's that's coming in with artificial intelligence driving some of those. In uh, the actual manufacturing, there is 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Uh, there is IoT that's enabling some of these uh, you know, machines and, and their predictive maintenance. And uh, on the warehousing distribution side, there are, you know, the drones and, and the IOTs and the, and the augmented reality that's uh, coming in. So we are seeing essentially three different you know, sort of things that are shaking up this industry you know, with, with this disruption. First is 
technology ad adoption is becoming pervasive. You can't just shy away and stay behind a rock saying that my industry is you know, uh, not important uh, right now. Uh, and data is driving adoption everywhere. Second is a uh, lot of these uh, human to machine interactions will become prevalent because as you are embedding some of these uh, you know, machines and they are sort of replacing humans. So those interactions will, will become more and more mainstream and the ramifications of reskilling this redundant workforce and the tax implications are also going to be something that organizations are, uh, are going to grapple with. Right. right. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, uh, and the third point uh, is disintermediation of the, of the entire value chain. So if you are a big organization, you can't retain your number on one position because someone with a 3D printing capability and material science knowledge or with a augmented reality capability is going to disrupt your designing or your manufacturing process. Right. So I think these are the sort of three large uh, you know, challenges or watch outs for the industry that you know, we need to be aware of. Okay. I'd like to thank our panelists for a very informative and insightful session. Manufacturing is one of India's high growth sectors and with the Make in India campaign, the government has accorded it with the same importance as other high growth industries. The sector, however, has a long way to go and technology will play a vital role in this. Business leaders in the manufacturing sector need to spend more time understanding the emerging disruptive technologies available to them to boost their efficiencies and make them both nationally and globally competitive. Thank you. Mm -hmm.